I'll tell you what, though. I, I've been listening to uh, some of Beyonce's album, the new album, the country one. Um, and everyone has what feels like a lot of feelings. Like some people are like, this isn't country. Some people are like, what a beautiful country album. You know, so. And some people are just interested in it because they feel like um, someone as big as Beyonce making a country album brings brings people back to at least at least some semblance of the history of like black origins within country music, right? Because and 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 I don't expect everyone to know. I didn't know. My friend was telling me all of this stuff. I didn't just know this offhand. My friend was telling me that. Um, a lot of the instruments that come from early country, because like a lot of country comes from bluegrass, and so some of those bluegrass instruments were instruments that slaves made, right? Because they already had origins in West Africa. Things like the banjo, which were initially made with like gourds, stuff like that, like things that would later become the banjo, things that would become the fiddle, things that would become the tambourine that, that were infused in this bluegrass that became this country music. Also, while a lot of, um, a lot of the chanting from spirituals ended up as like choral elements and lyrics in some early country songs. And I thought that was so interesting. It's, it's, it's like weirdly buried because everything has to be such such a, a, a binary for us. This is either black music or white music or anything. And I think people's, you know, people's contributions sometimes get diminished because of that. And then some people were talking about how it's important for Beyonce to make a country album because it, it is an over shadowing experience of a black person doing country that opens the door for more black people who are already doing country, right? And that there's been some resistance to that, which I, which a part of me does kind of get. Like if you're if you're in country and you see Beyonce coming, <laughs> wouldn't you be like, we have to stop this? <laughs> this can't come on. Don't please. <laughs> you know what I mean? Something seems like super, super white, and then a black person comes, and they're like very talented in it, you know? You let Tiger play a little bit of golf. <laughs> and not, not only did he win all the titles, he banged all of your women. <laughs> Tiger alone, I, you know? And then you see Beyonce coming, you're like, can I have nothing? <laughs> So yeah, that's where the resistance is, is coming from. <laughs> you know. But that's why I find so fascinating about the origins of a lot of music in America. So much of that music comes originally in some aspect from slavery, whether it's like um, blues, country, you know, there, there, there are rock elements, there are jazz elements. There, there, it's, it's amazing that this horrific thing, this really horrible thing, what the people that it happened to turned it into is some of the most beautiful things that we have. I think that's incredible. I really do. I think about, I, th I actually think about it a lot because I don't think that everyone would be able to do that. Like what if the roles were reversed? What would the white spirituals be? Because we can't take this lightly. We cannot take this lightly. I know I've used the word already in the set, but slavery was an abomination of humanity. No person should ever be able to treat another person this way. And out of all of these horrors came some of the most beautiful things that we've ever heard. Even if just down connecting the lines, connecting the dots to a person that's alive now. They have this music because this thing happened and someone made something beautiful out of it. But what if it was reversed? <laughs> what if there were whites in the fields <laughs> tilling the earth under the hot sun? 
which is not kind <laughs> to white backs. <laughs> and as they are tilling this earth, they're trying to find something in all of this devastating trauma to exhale their hurt in a, as beautiful way of, as possible to build community among themselves. And they're tilling the earth as hard as they can, right? And then in the distance you hear, just a small town girl. <laughs> Slave master Jamal comes out. <laughs> What's that bullshit out here? <laughs> Yo, everybody get back to work, for real. Ain't nobody playing with y'all. I think that uh, one very, very important thing that we have to do as, as, as people, like as a country, to move forward is I think we have to genuinely decide who needs to be in jail. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Because this, this is my thing. We can all agree that you do need jail. Like we've all met someone that was like, hmm, this feels like... <laughs> This feels like jail behavior. <laughs> I don't want to risk running into this in traffic. I need you out over here, right? So we all have an understanding of the, the purpose of jail, but we don't seem to agree on everything that someone should go to jail for, but there are some baseline things that we all agree someone should go to jail for. But then people do those things and then they don't go to jail and then people do other things, things that we say are very bad, things that we say you should go to jail for, and then they go to jail. And then we do change the law <laughs> while they're in jail. Like I think about everybody who, you know, was in jail for weed possession in states where weed is currently legal. They went to jail, and I understand that they broke the law, but they went to jail, and then we decided as people, because it's something that had to be voted on, that, no, nah, this thing shouldn't be illegal. And then they're sitting in jail like, so. <laughs> what about me? Oh, no? Okay, I'll stay. Wow. Like, I had a friend who went to jail for, uh, like, weed possession, right? And... He did have a lot. <laughs> he, had, he had quite a bit on him. He had, I'll, I'll call it an entrepreneurial amount. <laughs> yeah. They popped his truck and they were like, oh, you're a businessman. <laughs> And he went to jail and he, and you know, he said one of the craziest experiences was that when he got out and his friend came to pick him up and they were driving away from the jail, one of the closest things built near the jail was a dispensary. <laughs> and so he's like, uh, maybe they're hiring. <laughs> yeah. Cause we all know people in theory, who should be in jail and aren't. You know what I mean? We've all worked with somebody who we know is crazy. 
Somebody who is like, if anybody gonna shoot up the job, it's gonna be him. And we all know, people in different departments are like, have you met him? Stay away, don't make eye contact. He crazy, right? Then you go home, you watching Hulu documentaries about true crime and stuff, and then you watching a documentary like, that's everything Kevin do. That is... I guess we just have to wait for him to do something jail worthy, but um, all the general habits he does have. You know, I had my own experience. I was, I was at a, a diner and I was, I was eating, truly minding my own business. And then there was this guy sitting across from me and the guy sitting across from me got his meal and he had, he had soup. And I want to be clear, he had a spoon. That's very important. Everything I say next is unnecessary because he had soup and he had a spoon, all right? Everything required, soup and a spoon, he had it. God gave him everything he needed in this situation, a soup and a spoon to go with the soup. And rather than using the spoon like any normal, maybe tax-paying citizen, this man grabbed two forks, shoved them together, dipped them in the soup, lifted it up slightly, and was slurping it while maintaining eye contact with me. And as he did, I was like, lock his ass up. Is he doing this? He doing something else? It was crazy as hell. <laughs> 